If it's Friday, communities across America are reeling from recent mass shootings as President Biden vows a renewed push on legislation to ban assault weapons. But he'll have to get it done before Republicans take over the House in January. Plus, Ukraine's people wage a winter war for their own survival as Russian strikes cripple the country's energy grid. NBC News sits down one on one with Ukraine's former president about what the war torn nation needs to survive. And soaring inflation collides with one of the most important days of the year for U.S. retailers, as the Federal Reserve warns the U.S. might be headed toward a recession next year. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Kristen Welker on this day after Thanksgiving. We begin with an issue that tragically keeps pushing its way to the front of the headlines, gun violence in America. According to the Gun Violence Archive, there have been 610 mass shootings this year in the United States. That number was also higher than 600 in both 2020 and 2021 as well. After mass shootings this week at a nightclub in Colorado Springs and a Walmart in Chesapeake, Virginia, President Biden is again calling for federal action on gun reform. Speaking to reporters outside a fire station on Nantucket on Thanksgiving, he spoke about two potential reforms to help curb the violence. Red flag laws, period, just based on knowledge, not on a parent saying or a loved one saying, you should arrest this person now for his own sake. It's ridiculous. We got a, one of the first red flag laws in the state of Delaware, my son Bo, is the one enforcing it. And it made a lot of difference. It saved lives. So that's number one. Number two, the idea, the idea we still allow semi-automatic weapons to be purchased is sick. It's just sick. It has no, no social redeeming value. Zero. None. The reality check here, the kind of sweeping changes that President Biden described, is action only Congress can deliver. And it's highly unlikely that the incoming House Republican majority is going to take up those issues, which means if the president is serious about pushing for gun reform on banning assault weapons, he has to move quickly while Democrats still have control. Reporters pressed him about that narrowing window for action. Can you do anything about gun laws during the lame duck, sir? I'm going to try. What will you try and do? I'm going to try to get rid of assault weapons. Still, the president doesn't seem to have nearly enough votes to get an assault weapons ban passed in the lame duck. After mass shootings at a supermarket in Buffalo, New York, and an elementary school in Uvalde earlier this year, the Democratic-controlled Congress could only reach compromise with Republicans on a narrow gun reform bill that encouraged states to pass their own red flag laws and expanded some federal background checks. Now, during that push, the House passed a national red flag law and a federal assault weapons ban. But... They went nowhere in the Senate where Democrats still need Republicans votes to act. This is the United States has averaged about two mass shootings a day this year. According to the Gun Violence Archive, they define a mass shooting as any incident where at least four victims have been shot, not including the shooter. Joining me now to discuss all of this from Nantucket, where the Bidens are spending their holiday, is NBC News senior White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell. NBC Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Vitali is with me. And we have two correspondents on the ground in those communities still reeling from those mass shootings this week. Cal Perry is in Chesapeake, Virginia, and Maura Barrett is in Colorado Springs. And Kelly, I want to start with you. We just heard what President Biden had to say about wanting to pass an assault weapons ban, you know the votes are not there right now. Do they have a strategy for this legislative push? Is this a real thing that he's going to try to do when he gets back? Well, the president said he wanted to really give it an assessment and to see where the votes are. And as you heard him lay out his views on this, uh, these are positions he's held for a very long time. They're positions where he knows the contours of the law and he's got some passion about these issues. But he also recognizes what can and cannot be done in the current political climate. At the same time, as you pointed out, he signed some other legislation that was thought to be very difficult to ever accomplish. And that did 
did happen. And so there is a sense in uh, certainly the president's view that talking about these issues, pushing for them and making sure they get oxygen, especially in the wake of tragedies like we're seeing in very real terms now, uh, is one way to try to push this forward. Uh, that is in part to try to get the public behind these things. But in practical terms, uh, he has his best chance with Democrats in control of both the House and the Senate. And that is only a matter of weeks before the new Congress comes into office in early January. So the president did not overpromise on this. He did not say it is definitely a part of his lame duck strategy or that there is a specific mm -hmm. plan to do that. They have other priorities as well. But he is getting this issue in the conversation again, and he said he will look to see where the votes are, and he'll keep talking about this, believing that a ban on assault weapons is one of the thematic and policy objectives that he wants to be attached to his presidency. Kristen? And Kelly, we know that the president is once again playing the role of consoler in chief. He spoke with the owners of Club Q on Thanksgiving. What can you tell us about that and his outreach to the victims? Well, one of the things we see from the president is wanting to make that personal connection. And so he placed that call to offer his sympathies and concerns. That, that shooting, of course, happened last Saturday and wanting to make that connection. And we've seen the president at times offer the sort of support with federal resources. At times, it's a more personal connection and to offer empathy and concern. We saw in his remarks at the uh, fire station yesterday where he referenced the policy through the political life of his late son, Bo, who had been the uh, attorney general of Delaware and talking about red flag laws and how that could have been uh, utilized in that particular incident where when the, when there are known issues in uh, the background of a potential suspect or someone who acts out in this way, those laws need to be used. Now, the president today is with his family here on Nantucket. They stopped for lunch. They also went out and are doing a little Black Friday shopping. He has not spoken further on this issue, but they are out and about here in Nantucket. Kristen? And I know reporters will continue to try to get questions to him. Kelly O'Donnell, appreciate that. Ali Vitali, let me turn to you because Kelly lays out the reality check so well here, right? That he wants to assess yeah. where the votes may or may not be. Talk to me a little bit about what your sources are telling you uh, from Capitol Hill about whether or not there's any appetite to explore this in the lame duck. We know that once Republicans take control of the House in the new year, it's really tough to see anything getting done on gun reform. Yeah, that's exactly right. The president's assessment of where the votes are is probably going to be a pretty short one because the reality is, as Kelly laid out, it's not likely that this gets done even in the lame duck while Democrats still have control of the House and the Senate. Of course, definitely not in January once the House is overtaken by Republicans. But look, the landscape right now for the lame duck is that gun violence prevention is likely not going to be on the list. But there are a whole litany of other items that absolutely are, including, chief among them, funding the government. That funding runs out on December 16th, something that Congress is going to have to deal with immediately. But we're also hearing from some Democratic senators who say that they should deal with things like the debt ceiling now while they have the known entities of Democrats running both houses because of the slim majorities that Republicans are going to be plagued with, frankly, once they take over the House. And because there are some agitators on the fringe of that, of that conference who don't want to necessarily move forward in natural fashion on the basic things that would keep the government funded and running. And so there are some Democrats who are even pushing for a debt ceiling look right now. But there's also same-sex marriage. The Senate has made moves on that, and we expect this week at some point for them to be able to take the ultimate vote on codifying same-sex marriage. But then also they've got election reform and the possibility of even more funding for Ukraine on this lame duck docket. So they've got a very long to-do list already, even as the president once again makes a call for the assault weapons ban that's likely not going anywhere fast. Yeah, it's a really good point. Ali, you talk about the fringe, and I want to follow up with you on that, because here is Leader mm -hmm. McCarthy, who is trying to get the votes uh, to be speaker. He's going to have a very narrow oh, majority. Yeah. Is there any sense that he is willing to try to find some common ground with President Biden, with Democrats, when he takes over, given that he has such a slim majority, Ali? 
It's really going to be one of the interesting things because not only does McCarthy have to get to 218 to actually become speaker, and certainly he's making concessions within his conference right now as he tries to cobble together the requisite number of people in order to get to that 218 number. I actually asked McCarthy last week before everyone left town if he would welcome some Democrats to be part of that 218 that would help him, him, help him get to speaker. He told me no, and certainly that was one of the discussions early on as people were trying to figure out how McCarthy would do the math and get the numbers that he needs. But becoming speaker will be difficult, although as we get into what this House conference looks like, I wonder if we might look back and wonder if that wasn't the easy part for Kevin McCarthy, just because of how slim his margins are going to be. And because you've got fringe members of this conference who want to see certain things done, but then also when margins are as tight as this, everyone gets to be a kingmaker, and there are some moderate Republicans who could have their own things that they want from McCarthy. It's going to be a real push and pull. It is going to be just a fascinating dynamic, that is for sure. Cal Perry, let me turn to you in Chesapeake, Virginia, and I understand you've got some new details about the gunmen in that horrific mass shooting there. What are you learning? So police today releasing a note that they found in the gunman's phone. Keep in mind that the FBI and the ATF, along with local authorities, searched the gunman's home on Wednesday, just a day after the shooting. In that phone, they found a note that detailed, at least in the eyes of the gunman, why he was carrying out these murders. Now, most of this note uh, was rambling, very clearly psychotic. This is a disturbed individual. That is obvious. Um, but the note did point uh, to this relationship between the gunman and the other employees at this Walmart, the gunman saying uh, that he believed that the employees had turned their back on him, that they were mocking him, that they were laughing at him. Um, he expressed disappointment in that. And, and, and he said um, in this note that he planned on carrying out these heinous murders. And it was something um, that at least at the end of the note, he acknowledged uh, that he would need forgiveness for. The other thing that was released today by police um, was the information about the handgun. This handgun was purchased, the gun used in this shooting was purchased by the gunman the morning of the shooting at a nearby store and it was done so legally which brings up uh, the conversation that you are having this broader conversation um, not just about how communities are mourning and need to mourn um, but about how communities find themselves asking who's going to be next and is this going to happen again there have been a number of high profile mass murders shootings that have taken place in Virginia just in the past month um, and people here are aware of that this is an open carry state so the conversation about legislation is one that is happening now. Will it happen in the long term, I think, is your question, is the question uh, that people here are asking. Yeah, it is a debate that continues to be revived every time we are dealing with one of these mass shootings. Cal, Sorry. very quickly before I turn to Mora, what are you learning about the victims today? Yes, yeah, so the six that were killed all worked at this store. Uh, tragic stories about Thanksgiving seeds left empty. Just one of the victims, for example, um, his mother talked about how with her 16 grandchildren, it just wasn't going to feel the same, how, how that Thanksgiving table was empty. A 16-year-old boy, you can see there, um, Fernando Chavez Barron, killed. Um, his family was, was here yesterday, and it's impossible to explain to people uh, what it's like to see family members just so completely grief-stricken, without any answers, hysterical in the parking lot of a Walmart. Um, it's just been such a hard scene here. I'm sure it's just absolutely devastating to be there. Maura, I want to turn to you. It's hard to believe that we are talking about two mass shootings, uh, but Maura, you and I have been talking now for several days. The suspect in the shooting in Colorado Springs at Club Q appeared in court on Wednesday. Talk a little bit about what came from that and what you're expecting and watching for next. There's still a lot of information to be learned about this suspect, Kristen. And when we saw him, them for the first time uh, via video, uh, it was very clear once after we hearing all of those stories about the hero, Richard Fierro, uh, and the other two heroes that helped subdue the shooter, you could see the suspect's face puffy, bruised, um, scabs all over their face as they slumped in their chair for this appearance. As a reminder, they're being held without bond right now, arrested on suspicion for five counts 
counts of murder charges, five counts of potential hate crimes. And so we are waiting to see when they might be in court again. It's right now scheduled for early December, and we're waiting for those form formal charges to be filed as well as any potential federal charges. Now, something that was a surprise on Wednesday morning was defense attorneys filing a motion overnight identifying the shooter uh, as someone who identifies as non-binary, using they, them pronouns. Now, since then, we've talked to a neighbor who knew the suspect very well, one of the few humans we've been able to get in touch with that knew the suspect very well because it seems like they spend a lot of time online and not as much of a social uh, person. This neighbor adamant that this person he knew was not someone that ever identified as non-binary, was not someone that ever corrected uh, him for using he, him pronouns. And so that's something that we'll have to continue to watch uh, because of that intersection of whether this is determined a hate crime or not. And so this is something that is still developing. Police say the investigation is ongoing and they intend to bring additional charges as they find out more information. We also know police intend to release another news release on Monday. Uh, so it, it remains to be seen what that might entail. But again, waiting for any formal charges to be brought as the suspect is held without um, bond. Yeah, it will be very interesting to see what, if any, formal charges are brought. Are there more charges that are added on to the ones that you just talked about? Maura, we understand that some of the victims are still in the hospital. What can you tell us about their recovery? So as you remember, 18 people were injured in this shooting, some from gunshot wounds, some from the scramble of people trying to escape Club Q when the shooting happened. I was able to get in touch with one of the hospitals today, Penrose. Two patients were discharged. Another patient remains uh, in stable condition. So that is good news. We haven't gotten an update from the other hospital in terms of the uh, patients who are injured. But in terms of how the community is pulling together to support both the injured and remember the victims, you might be able to see behind me the police perimeter around Club Q just over opened uh, in the last 24 hours. There was a memorial on the block outside uh, as close as people could get and people are filtering through right now bringing all of the flowers, all of the memorials, all of the signs uh, to be closer to this place, this physical space that represented a very a home for many people, they've been telling me. And so that community that was built inside this club is very clearly present outside the club. This is something uh, over Thanksgiving, the last 10 years, Club Q hosted at Thanksgiving mm. for people in the queer community that didn't feel comfortable going home to their blood family, this was their chosen family. And we see that continue to sh them continuing to show up here in Colorado Springs as they continue to mourn, Kristen. It just adds to all of the heartbreak there. And we do see them gathering behind you. Maura, thank you so much. And thank you for detailing the fact that this was a home, a place of belonging for so many people that has now been shattered. Really appreciate your reporting, Maura. And before that, Kelly, Allie, and Cal. Great reporting all around. Coming up next, an update on the war and power crisis across Ukraine. We will hear from former Ukrainian President Petro Poroshenko as his country enters a brutal winter reality. Our Courtney Cuby has that. And later, a viral perfect storm. COVID, flu, and RSV swamping U.S. hospitals, while some shortages of antibiotics and antivirals could soon be complicating care. You're watching Meet the Press now. Stay with us on this day after Thanksgiving. Welcome back. After months of delay, Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban announced yesterday Hungary will ratify Finland and Sweden's NATO membership early next year. Hungary and Turkey are the only two remaining NATO members who have yet to ratify the applications by the Nordic states. Meanwhile, at NATO headquarters in Brussels, Secretary General Stoltenberg said he will urge nations to contribute more to Ukraine's defense during next week's foreign ministers meeting, adding, quote, if we let Putin win, all of us will pay a much higher price for many years to come. And of course, all of this comes as Russian airstrikes continue to pummel Ukraine and its energy infrastructure, cutting off heat and power to huge swaths of the country with winter fast approaching. I'm joined now on set by NBC News Pentagon correspondent Courtney Cuby. Courtney, so good to see you. You too, thanks. So you spoke exclusively with the former president of Ukraine, Petro Poroshenko. What is he telling you? What were your key takeaways from your conversation? Yeah, that's right. So, you know, remember, he was a political rival for to President Zelensky, but after the Russian invasion, he told us that that all went out the window and they are focused now on one Ukraine defeating Russia taking back their land and protecting their people. As part of that, he's in a very unique position because he actually, as president, negotiated with Vladimir Putin in 2014. So he understands more than most people what that actually is like. So I started out by asking him about that. Exactly what does it mean to negotiate with Putin and is now the time? Here's what he had to say. 
I am definitely for negotiation. Okay. But uh, we have a very great negotiator from Ukrainian side. He is a top diplomat. And the name of this negotiator is Armed Forces of Ukraine. We have a very successful tour negotiation when we throw Russia away from around Kyiv. Russia said that that was a gesture of goodwill. Second round negotiation was when we threw Russia away from Chernigov, Sumy. Third round was when we threw Russia away from the Kharkiv region. And a few days ago, it's happening that uh, this negotiator threw Russia from Kherson. So you think the armed forces of Ukraine can retake the Russian-occupied areas uh, with support I, from the international community? I have no doubt about that, because Ukrainian forces has absolutely different motivation. Our soldiers fighting for our soil, for our families, for our children, for our uh, women and wives. And Russia has no motivation, and they cannot even explain why they are on Ukrainian soil, what they are looking for. I mean, you're in a unique position because you've negotiated with Vladimir Putin in 2014. What do you think it would take for Putin to come to the negotiating table? Uh, and do you think there's any chance that that could be in the near future? First of all, yes. Second, uh, we, this is not an easy job to have a negotiation with Putin. It's not like this. Uh, third, I have a several recommendations for anybody who wants to analyze the possibility for negotiation. Point number one, please, don't trust Putin. Putin never keep his promises. Russia never keep his promises. What's the relationship like now with President Zelensky? And, and, and how do you see your role as the former president? Look, on the 24th of February, after two hours when the first Russian missiles attack uh, Ukrainian soil, which was happening two kilometers from my house, I was in the center of Kyiv in my office, called President Zelensky. And uh, when we met immediately, I said, Mr. President, I'm not anymore the leader of the opposition, having the second biggest fraction in the parliament. And you and me are the soldiers. And we united not around Poroshenko, not around Zelensky, we united around Ukraine. And the former president was here to meet with Biden administration officials because President Zelensky now cannot leave, but he can carry the message on behalf of the Ukrainian people and the Ukrainian government right now. It's just an extraordinary conversation, Court, and it, it's pretty stunning to hear him say that, yes, he thinks it is possible at some point for there to be a negotiation, but until that happens... What are the key things that Ukraine needs right now? Is it more military support? Because the yes. U.S. is giving a lot of aid and a lot of financial aid and military support as well. And yet Zelensky continues to say, we need more. They do. And, and they do need more. They will constantly need ammunition as long as they are fighting the Russians. They're going to continue to need more air defense systems, especially if the Russians start using their air force, which is very possible in the spring. They're going to need uh, continued support for radar systems so that they know where Russian systems are. They can attack back against them. But another thing that President Poroshenko talked about was they need humanitarian support, especially mm. going into the winter. But he also says they need the support of the international community, especially the U.S., if they go into negotiations with Vladimir Putin. They need the Ukrainian people and the Ukrainian government needs that support to be visible if they actually go into these negotiations, which he thinks is possible. It's just so striking to hear him say that. I wonder, we are entering the winter. We are entering the 10th month of this conflict, Courtney. What did former President Poroshenko tell you about his concerns and, and concerns more generally throughout Ukraine that there is going to be waning support from the U.S., from its European allies? He's very concerned about that. He, caught, he talked about Ukrainian fatigue, and that mm. would be the international community not being able to support the Ukrainian people, not just in this current fight, but if they are able to keep pushing the Russian military back to the Russian-occupied areas, the Ukrainian government has made it very clear that they want to clear out those occupied areas as well. And that's what he's worried about. He says he knows the Ukrainian military can do that. They can defeat the Russians. But he's worried about that continuing fight and the world losing 
their their will to keep supporting it. It's not just with with weapons. They're going to need more and more humanitarian supplies, especially as the winter gets colder. There's power outages. There are food shortages. Uh, they're going to the Ukrainian people will need help for years and years to come. Yeah, and and our reporters on the ground, yourself included, continue to detail just how difficult the winter months will be. Courtney QB, fantastic conversation. Congratulations. Thank you for bringing that to Thank us. You. We appreciate it. Coming up next, abortion emerges as a major issue in Georgia's Senate runoff election, now just 11 days away, as the state Supreme Court reinstates a sweeping ban on the procedure. We'll delve into that. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Republicans gained control of the House and Democrats held on to their majority in the Senate. But once again, Georgia is still on the minds of both parties ahead of the Senate runoff election on December 6th, as Democrats hope to put a one-seat cushion on their razor-thin majority. On Wednesday, the Georgia Supreme Court handed down a big victory to Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock's campaign against Republican Herschel Walker. The court rejected an appeal by the Republican Party seeking to prevent early voting tomorrow claiming it would allow, quote, illegal advance voting. It's the only Saturday Georgians will be able to cast an early vote ahead of Election Day. It comes as the state Supreme Court has just issued a major ruling on abortion, which has become a key issue in this race, reinstating a ban on the procedure after six weeks of pregnancy. Joining me now with some more insight into all of this in the Georgia runoff is Atlanta Journal-Constitution politics reporter and NBC News contributor Greg Bluestein. Good to see you, Greg. Thanks for being with me. Thank you for having me. So let's start right there with this decision by the Georgia Supreme Court to allow early voting tomorrow. How big of a win is that for the Warnock campaign? Well, look, tens of thousands of Georgians are expected to vote Saturday. And even Republicans were baffled by the opposition from state party and national party leaders towards Saturday voting. Uh, once, the, once an appellate court, once a lower court essentially upheld uh, a judge's ruling, they thought the fight was over, and they were baffled to see national and state Republican parties continue this fight. This is a big win for, for Warnock. If you ask him, he says it's a big win for Georgians, particularly among Georgians who can't vote, who are wage workers and find it hard to vote during weekdays. This gives those voters an outlet to vote on a, on a weekend. Well, it's a good point. I wonder if we can talk about the other ruling by the state Supreme Court, which is basically to put that six-week abortion ban back in place. We saw that abortion actually played a larger role in some of these very close races than even some of the polls showed us leading up to uh, Election Day. How big of a deal is this? Could this drive up turnout? Yeah, look, you're right. The polls can only show us so much. They showed the economy was the number one issue, but they showed that abortion was number two, number three, and still a huge concern to so many voters. And, and in this case, you have a divide between Herschel Walker and Senator Warnock that is as big as any in this entire race. It's over abortion. Uh, Senator Warnock wants to expand abortion rights. Herschel Walker wants to outlaw the procedure in all cases, including the cases of rape or incest. So you couldn't have a starker difference between where they stand. And Democrats, as upset as they are about this ruling, they hope it focuses more attention on abortion rights days before this pivotal runoff. Yeah, it is certainly a critical issue. That is for sure. Take us inside what you are seeing there on the ground. What are the strategies inside both of these campaigns in the closing days? Well, it really is all about the base. But it's really interesting because usually runoffs are about turnout. They're about getting that base back out. And you're seeing Herschel Walker really, you know, uh, basically repeat a lot of his campaign lines before the midterm about uh, transgender policies and border security, a lot of the, the lines that appeal to MAGA voters. Uh, but, but Senator Warnock is taking a different stance. He's really appealing to his core supporters as well as those split ticket voters who back both Governor Brian Kemp and him. And it's not usually, it's not something you usually see in a runoff period in Georgia where you have a candidate going towards middle of the road voters, but there's about 200,000 of them who voted in the, the midterms. Uh, these are voters that back Kemp and not uh, and not Herschel Walker, and they could be the ticket. They could be the key difference maker for Democrats. And so you hear from Senator Warnock an appeal to these swing voters relentlessly these last few weeks. Oh, that's really interesting. And let me ask you about a another Brian Kemp-related aspect, which is if you rewind, the Walker campaign was hoping that Governor Kemp would turn out support for them. How significant is it that he's just not on the ballot right now? 
Yeah, no, it's big. It's a big factor. And look, Governor Kemp uh, had a resounding victory over Stacey Abrams, but still, despite the fact that he and other statewide Republicans won uh, clear victories, Herschel Walker didn't. And so the, the coattails weren't quite there um, for Herschel Walker. Uh, now, Brian Kemp is out on the campaign trail. He's been a, had at least one appearance with Herschel Walker. He's also lent his get out the vote apparatus. He's directed that that machine he built to help Herschel Walker. Um, but look, the Democrats have a formidable get out the vote machine as well, and they're kicking it into high gear right now. All right. Well, Greg Bluesty, we know that you are gearing up for a busy several days ahead until December 6th. We appreciate your taking time to join us. Thank you for having me. Still ahead, Black Friday in an economy roiled by inflation. We'll take a look at what shoppers are saying. You're watching Meet the Press now. If Secretary Mayorkas does not resign, House Republicans will investigate every order, every action, and every failure will determine whether we can begin impeachment inquiry. Welcome back. That was House Republican leader Kevin McCarthy making an impeachment threat to Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas at the southern border on Wednesday. This is one of many investigations telegraphed by the incoming House majority as McCarthy tries to shore up support from the right flank in his caucus ahead of January's speaker vote, which is anything but a slam dunk for McCarthy right now. Joining me now to discuss all of this is Democratic strategist Adrian Elrod and former Florida Republican Congressman Carlos Corbello. He is also in NBC News political analyst. Thanks to both of you for being here. Hope you had great Thanksgivings. And now we have a lot of politics to chew on. Um, <laughs> Carlos, let me start with you. You heard what Leader McCarthy had to say. And of course, it comes as he's trying to shore up his right flank so he can actually win the speaker's gavel. But look, Republicans ran on a platform of tackling inflation. I mean, is this smart strategy for out of the gate the leader and other Republicans to be so focused on investigations, impeaching the DHS secretary? Well, Kristen, it's uh, these kinds of traps that Republicans have set up for themselves uh, that explain why they underperformed uh, in this 2022 midterm election. Republicans, because of the issue of inflation, were supposed to do so well, but because a lot of the issues uh, uh, inside of the party and, of course, the former president's theatrics and just his prominence uh, towards the end of the campaign season there, that really depressed uh, Republican numbers. And what you're seeing now, I think you uh, are absolutely right. This is Kevin McCarthy trying to get from 188 to 218. He's not speaking to the American public. He's speaking to those 30 House Republicans that he needs in order to get the speaker's gavel. He does not have the votes for now. Uh, and there are a handful of House Republicans who have said that under no circumstances they'll support him. So McCarthy is really doing everything he can and his audience is not the American people. It's not the swing voters that Republicans need to grow their majority in the House or to gain a Senate majority. It's just those 30 House members that he needs in order to become Speaker. Yeah, I think you're right about that one. Adrian, let me get your take. And I know you've been talking to folks over at the White House. It, based on my conversations with my sources, they've been really gearing up and trying to brace for these investigations that are coming their way. Everything from uh, looking into, as McCarthy just said, the DHS secretary potentially, Hunter Biden, the origins of COVID. Do you get the sense that the White House is deeply concerned about these investigations or are they prepared? What do you think? Yeah, I think they're prepared, Kristen. And, and look, you know, there's been a number of outside groups that have launched um, to help defend these attacks. You know, there's only so much the White House can do in terms of, um, you know, the internal mechanics of defending. So it's important that you have an outside apparatus that is well-funded, that is well-staffed, that is well-researched uh, to provide that apparatus that, that can make sure that not only are they defending, um, you know, some, from some of these meritless attacks, but they're also making sure that the narrative does not get away from this White House and that uh, the White House can also stay on the offensive. But look, I think the Congressman is exactly right. I mean, not only has the White House been preparing for this, but this is the predicament that Kevin McCarthy's in. The voters in the 2022 midterms did not say, we want investigations. They actually said, we want government to work. And one of the reasons why Joe Biden did so well, even though he wasn't on the ballot, the Democrats did relatively well 
uh, a large part because of him and his agenda, is because he's actually gotten things done. So you contrast that with Kevin McCarthy's coming forward and saying, the first thing I'm going to do, you know, when I have any ounce of power in January, is we're going to impeach Secretary Mayorkas. That is not what the American people signed up for. So I think, you know, maybe it's going to help Kevin McCarthy in the short term get those 30 votes that the congressman just mentioned he needs. But it's not going to help the Republican Party grow their base so that they can do well in 2024. Well, let's fast forward to January for a moment, if we could, because you are going to have uh, Leader McCarthy and whether or not he actually becomes speaker, um, someone will be speaker of the House. And the challenge before them will be to try to fulfill some of those promises that were made on the campaign trail. Um, Carlos, let me start with you. Do you have a sense that President Biden and Leader McCarthy will be able to find any common ground, or are we just looking at partisan gridlock? Kristen, sadly, I think that we can expect a lot of partisan gridlock if uh, Kevin McCarthy does get the votes to become speaker. Why? Because the dynamic that we're observing now is what we will observe for the next two years if McCarthy does become speaker. He is going to be under constant threat from the right flank. And this is nothing new in the House Republican conference. This happened to John Boehner. It's the reason he decided to resign. When mm. Paul Ryan was speaker, he was always looking over his shoulder. Uh, so this is not new. The problem now is that the margin is so small. So McCarthy, his inclination, Kristen, and those of us who know him well, uh, understand this about him. He is someone who likes to build consensus. He does like to uh, reach across the aisle, but he is not going to able to do it often because of these members on the right that are going to be threatening him every step of the way, saying that they will depose him as speaker. So I think it's going to be a very tough two years in the U.S. Congress. Yeah, the dynamics will certainly be interesting to watch. Adrian, President Biden says he wants to look at the possibility of taking action on an assault weapons ban. Uh, now, our Kelly O'Donnell gives the caveat that he is saying he wants to assess whether the votes are actually there. It doesn't seem as though they have been there in the past. Is there any sense that this realistically could get done? And do you think that there is broad support among Democrats just to have a show vote? Is there a political value in doing that? I interviewed um, incoming Congressman Maxwell Frost, for example, who said he thinks there is. He wants to see a vote on this issue. Yeah, I think, Kristen, that's what's important here, is to see if there is a vote. I mean, I think the numbers are probably not there. We've had a number of mass shootings. And Legislation gets on the put on the floor and nothing happens. Um, you know, the legislation that was passed a couple of months ago, I think it's probably as far as we're going to be able to get. But it's still important that Democrats put something on the on the floor during lame duck when we still have, uh, you know, the votes in Congress to try to get something done and to get people on the record. You know, there's a lot of these Republicans that uh, flipped blue seats to red. Uh, that are really purple seats. Um, you know, some of these moderate mm. Republicans in upstate New York, for example. And they have to sort of run like Democrats if they want to do well and hold on to their seat in 2024. So it's not to say that there's not a chance. And obviously, if we do this in lame death, those members, the new members, won't be voting on it. It would have to ha happen in January. But I think we have to at least show the American people that we're yeah. trying and especially show the families who have lost victims to this these senseless acts that we're at least giving it a shot. Carlos, last question to you. Your take on this issue very quickly. Well, look, I think it's important for Democrats to understand that while Republicans underperformed in this election, Democrats didn't exactly win a mandate from the American people, okay? I mean, President Biden's numbers are still extremely low. I think the best path for Joe Biden is to be himself. And that's someone who's a consensus builder, who's a deal maker. He was not able to be himself during the first two years yeah. of his administration because Democrats had full control. Now there's divided government. He should be himself and he should look for consensus and stay away from these show votes. All right. Fantastic conversation, Adrian and Carlos. Thank you both so much. Well, this month we are celebrating the 75th anniversary of Meet the Press, the longest running show in television history with clips and highlights from our news archive vault. You can explore moments in history by scanning the QR code on your screen right now. And as we go to break on this family holiday week, here's then Vice President Joe Biden in 2012 as the country debated the civil rights of marriage equality. Take a look. You rate social policy. I'm curious. You know, the president has said that his views 
on gay marriage, on same-sex marriage, have evolved. But he's opposed to it. You're opposed to it. Have your views evolved? Look, uh, I just think uh, that uh, the good news is that as more and more Americans be come to understand what this is all about is a simple proposition. Who do you love? Who do you love? And will you be loyal to the person you love? And that's what people are finding out is what, what all marriages at their root are about. Well, whether they're marriages of lesbians or gay men or heterosexuals. Is that what you believe now? That's are what you, I believe. And you're comfortable with same-sex marriage now? I, I Look, I am vice president of the United States of America. Um, the president sets the policy. I am absolutely comfortable with the fact that men marrying men, women marrying women, and heterosexual men and women marrying women are entitled to the same exact rights, all the civil rights, all the civil liberties. And quite frankly, I don't see much of a distinction uh, beyond that. Welcome back on this Black Friday as inflation grips the country. Shoppers across the nation have been racing to find deals to combat rising prices. The National Retail Federation is estimating a record 166 million people will shop from now until Cyber Monday. That's up 8 million from last year. I'm joined now by NBC News business and data reporter Brian Chung, who is at the Garden State Mall in New Jersey. Brian, good to see you. Thanks for being with us. So set the scene. What are you seeing? What are you hearing? What are you expecting on this Black Friday and this shopping season, frankly? Well, Chris and I have been posted up here at the Westfield Garden State Plaza Mall all day, and there's plenty of people out and about. But it's interesting. I was talking to a lot of shoppers today who frequent this mall, and they say they don't feel like there's as much foot traffic this year as there was last year. And indeed, it is the case that when you take a look at inflation prices, 7.7 percent mm -hmm. higher this year than they were this time last year. That is pinching Americans' wallets such that they might not be able to buy gifts for as many people this year. Although, of course, no one wants to have an empty uh, Christmas tree this season. So people still coming out, buying things, albeit making a few compromises this holiday season, Kristen. Well, are retailers making any changes to deal with rising inflation that you're seeing at this point, Brian? Yeah, well, you can see around the shops here at the mall, you see a lot of promotions, 40, 50, in some cases, 60 percent off. If Americans are feeling a little tighter on their wallets, then the retailers have to meet them at a lower price point. So you're seeing maybe some more discounting this year compared to last year. But again, Americans broadly still concerned about food, rent, gasoline prices being higher, those things you really need on a daily basis. So a bit of a mixed picture here as Americans who want to go out and spend, want to get things for their loved ones, maybe having to make some compromises as they try to go out and find those gifts this weekend. All right, Brian Chung, thank you so much. I hope you can get some shopping done since you are there in the mall. Get that shopping list checked off. All right, well, as families gather for the holidays, concerns about a so-called triple-demic continue to loom. Across the country, cases of COVID, flu, and RSV are surging and overwhelming some hospitals. And the FDA says we can expect shortages of antiviral medication and antibiotics to continue this flu and cold season. I'm joined now by Dr. Kavita Patel, former White House Policy Director to President Obama and an NBC News medical contributor. Dr. Patel, so good to see you. Thanks for being here. Thanks so much, Kristen. So just set the scene for us. How concerned are doctors, how concerned is the medical community right now about this so-called triple-demic? Yeah, it's pretty concerning, and it's been concerning for several weeks, especially in children's hospitals. Almost every children's hospital in the country is either at or over capacity. In fact, pediatricians sent an urgent plea to the Biden administration last week asking for a specific public health emergency because of what they're seeing. And if it gets worse, that just means that we're straining not only the healthcare system, but Kristen, think about the downstream effect. These are mm. parents who can't go to work. They've got to take care of their children. Schools that won't have those children attend because they're sick and so on and so you can just imagine that this could get a lot worse before it gets better. Yeah, the ripple effect is potentially staggering. Dr. Patel, are any of the three viruses that we just talked about, COVID, RSV and the flu, are any of those three showing signs that they may have peaked at this point? 
Yeah, and so the interesting thing about RSV and flu, and actually COVID, Kristen, as you've been covering for several years now, is that we see this regional pattern, and that is definitely true with all three of the viruses causing the triple demic. We're seeing a peak and, and a, even a decline in the mid-Atlantic and northeast for RSV specifically, and flu is starting to pick up in many parts of the country, the southeast, southwest, mid-Atlantic, northeast. So we're seeing a little bit of these varying paces. Of course, travel. People are going all over the country, so that could change that regionality a little bit but I do think that hopefully hopefully fingers crossed we will get through the season and it's just another reminder if you haven't gotten your flu shot if you haven't been up to date on your COVID shots it's never too late and you can get that done now yeah really important reminder and of course we do have vaccines you can get for the flu and COVID but not yet RSV. Is there anything, I mean, a parent like myself, this is what I'm most concerned about. Is there, are there any steps that parents can take to try to prevent their kids from getting RSV? Yeah, an interesting point and something we've forgotten. If you recall in early 2020, Kristen, we were all, or many of us, myself included, were wiping down counters and surfaces and packages because we weren't so sure about the majority of transmission of COVID and we thought it could be on surfaces. Well, RSV really is what we call a fomite transmission, meaning touching things. Mm. So you touch your nose, touch your mouth, cough into your mouth, and you touch a counter and it can live on surfaces for hours. So one one thing to just do is if you've got someone sick in your household, do make sure that you're, you're sanitizing, washing hands, using a mask where you can, especially adults. And then, of course, kids. I know they're all drippy, my own kids included, drippy, <laughs> and they're just kind of all leak, leaking everywhere. Just making sure you wipe surfaces down, doorknobs. Think about the things that people are commonly touching, especially during the holiday season with a packed house. That can minimize the transmission. And Dr. Patel, one question I think that so many parents have, if your child does contract any of these three viruses, how do you know when it is time to go to the emergency room? You know, I always tell my patients that uh, a parent's instinct is, is the knowledge of when it's time. But especially mm. if you see temperatures that if you're concerned about a temperature, a fever, for example, that is not able to come down with Tylenol or a fever reliever medication. And of course, don't be afraid to pick up and call your local pediatrician, the nurses. They're all available 24 seven, even on call. And then if you see especially a child that's struggling to breathe, that they're using their neck muscles to breathe, they're using their stomach muscles to breathe, that means they're just not able to kind of use their lungs more efficiently and they're having a hard time getting oxygen in. And then also any fussy, you know, sleep, not sleeping, kind of the lack of signs. They're not necessarily eating. Those are all, if, you're, if your little instinct is, as any parent has goes off, listen to it and push because we're yeah. seeing so many things happening right now in, around in hospitals in the ERs. All right, Dr. Kavita Patel, such important information. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoy the rest of your holiday weekend. We want to turn now to the sports world, where the World Cup continues to be plagued by controversies. On Wednesday, Germany's national team protested FIFA's ban on the One Love armbands that many European teams are planning on wearing. Germany's coach said the gesture was a sign from the team that FIFA is, quote, muzzling us. The armband is meant to symbolize inclusion and diversity and has been seen as a rebuke to Qatar's human rights record. I'm joined now by NBC News foreign correspondent Megan Fitzgerald, who is in Doha covering the World Cup. So let's talk about that backdrop, Megan. The national team from Iran garnered a lot of attention after staying silent during their national anthem. What was the impact of that and the impact that protesters are having on the World Cup? You know, Kristen, that was certainly one of the boldest protests we've seen. As you mentioned, the Iranian men standing on the pitch, not singing, standing silent when their national anthem was playing, seemingly standing in solidarity with the women of their country fighting for change. But it's not just the players. We have seen uh, Iranian fans in the stands with signs saying freedom to Iran. We saw protesters outside of the stadium. Uh, today and the other day when Iran uh, took the pitch as well, we saw that there were some fans trying to get inside the stadium with flags that were anti-Iranian government and they were stopped. They weren't allowed to go inside. Uh, but, you know, what we're seeing here is as people are paying attention, this is one of the biggest stages for sports. Billions of eyes are, are watching. And we're seeing the Iranian players, as you mentioned, the same is true for uh, many of the European teams, leveraging this platform and hoping that the world is listening to the message that they're trying to provide. Yeah, and Kristen. Megan, we only have about 30 seconds left, but bring us up to speed on the big game the U.S. faced off against England. What was the results? And tell us what it means. Yeah, that's right. 
Okay, so the U.S. took the field. They weren't supposed to win this, and they didn't, but they tied. So they, they beat the odds, if, if you could say that. Uh, a zero-to-zero zero tie with England. England came out hot, but the Team USA held their own throughout the entire game. It went into overtime. Zero-zero in the end, but the Team USA still has to beat Iran next week in order to make it to the knockout round, Kristen. All right. A tie's a lot like a win in this case. Megan Fitzgerald, thanks for all of your great reporting. Now we want to share with you a developing story from space, the Artemis mission taking its next big step to enter the moon's orbit. NASA's Orion spacecraft is traveling around the moon in the opposite direction of the moon's traveling around Earth, doing so at an extremely high altitude from the lunar surface called the Direct Retrograde Orbit Insert Burn. It's the second maneuver in Orion's journey. Artemis, the U.S. mission to return humans back to the moon, finally launched last week, of course, for a 26-day test flight after several attempts were called off for weather and technical challenges. Now, if all goes as planned, astronauts could step foot again on the lunar surface as early as 2025, over 50 years after the final Apollo mission. Exciting stuff from out of this world. Thank you for being with us this hour. We'll be back on Monday with more Meet the Press Now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.